when news was spread by way of telegraph, jobs were offered as Morse code operators. There was an ad that was posted in the paper of one city. Several men showed up wanting to apply for the position. The office was busy. There was a lot of hustle and bustle, a lot of activity, a lot of noise, including the chatter of the uh, telegraph key sounding off in the background. And there was a sign as the men walked in, there was a sign that instructed the applicants to take a seat and wait until they were summoned to come in for an interview. There was about a half a dozen men that were there, and so they were all sitting there waiting. And then a little bit later, another young man walked in, and he sees all the other gentlemen there, and he kind of assesses the situation, and a couple of minutes later, he walks on into the office. And everybody's just kind of shocked that how can, you know, how can he just jump in in front of us like that? A few minutes later, the young man came out with the employer, and the boss said, okay, gentlemen, you can go now. Well, you can imagine how shocked they were, and some of them were upset, and one man spoke up, and he says, I, I don't understand. He was the last one to come in. How is it that he could come in and walk in and get his interview and then come out with a job when none of us ever had a chance? He says, how is that fair? And the employer said, well, I'm sorry, but... All the time you've been sitting there, the telegraph key was sending out a message in Morse code that if you're interested in the job, to walk on into the office for your interview. <laughs> he said, he walked in, you didn't, he's got the job, you don't. Well, that's a pretty accurate picture of how the Word of God is for us in the world. There's a lot of people who are deafened by all the activities, all the noise, all the hubbub that's going on, all the distractions that they can't hear the message of God. They're paying attention to everything else, and they can't hear the message coming from God. Now, thankfully, many of the Ephesians in this Ephesian church heard that message, and they responded in repentance and faith, and a good church was planted there in that pagan city. Most, if not all of us, have also heard the message, thanks to to the work of the Holy Spirit, because that's part of his responsibility, is to open our hearts and enable us to hear the message. And we responded as well. And the result is that we, along with the Ephesian believers, have been blessed with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places in Christ. And we've been talking about that for the last several weeks. And Paul has outlined for us how each member of the Godhead plays a vital role in securing our salvation and he gives us the riches of his grace. Someone said that the Father thought it, the Son bought it, and the Spirit wrought it. And I like that. It's a good preaching outline. So far we've learned that God the Father has chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, and that he has predestined all those whom he has chosen to adoption as sons. He's accepted us in the Beloved, and we are in Christ in him, that's the key. That's the most important phrase that you'll find in this whole letter to the Ephesians, being in Christ. It speaks of the believer's unity with the Savior. And then we learn that God the Son, he's given us unsearchable riches by providing for us redemption, forgiveness, revelation, and an eternal inheritance. And we saw that last week. But now the question remains is, how can we be certain of these things? How can I know that I've got this inheritance in store for me? That all of these things that we read about, how can I be sure that they're really ours? And that's where the ministry of the Holy Spirit comes in. So I want to read verse 3, because that's kind of the intro to these verses 3 through 14, talking about the spiritual blessings, and then follow up with verse 13 and 14, which is our text for today. Paul said, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. In Him you also trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also having believed you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession 
to the praise of his glory. I believe firmly that God wants to confirm all of his promises to us. He does not want us to go through life worrying about whether these promises are bona fide and whether I can trust him for it. He's the God who cannot lie, remember? And so we need to trust him. He's promised these things so that we can enjoy the kind of peace. Remember the Lord Jesus, he said in John chapter 14, he's speaking to his disciples and he He's talking about sending the Holy Spirit, and he told them, he says, The Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. And so, loved ones, my prayer for this message today is that if you're doubting or if you're wondering, that you will find some assurance through the promises of God's Word and through the text that we're reading today, that we can trust in His promises. God does not want us to worry or fear losing what He has promised us. Now, the last section reveals how God provides assurance for us through the spiritual blessings that come from the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit plays a key role in securing our salvation so that we can be absolutely sure of the internal inheritance. And Paul reveals how that takes place. And it's important for us to understand the ministry of the Holy Spirit because there's a whole lot of different ideas out there, a lot of confusion, I believe, concerning the ministry of the Holy Spirit and how he operates in the church today. Last Thursday, we went over some of the Word of Faith teachers and some of the nonsensical things that these guys are teaching in the name of the Spirit. Supposedly, the Spirit gives them this special revelation, and they teach really weird stuff. We uh, saw some of the things that they promote, like, we are all little gods. Or Benny Hinn taught on one occasion, he talks about the Trinity, and he says you have God the Father, God the Son, and God the Spirit. And then he says each member of the Trinity is a Trinity in itself, and so he says, so we have nine of them. He didn't get that from the Bible. And then, of course, Kenneth Copeland, he is probably the, the biggest wolf in sheep's clothing around on national television he declared speaking from the office of the prophet and he declared COVID-19 gone he proposed a curse and then he blows the, the wind of God well COVID's still here isn't it so I guess that disqualifies him from being a prophet of God because according to Deuteronomy chapter 18 if you're not 100% accurate in your predictions, in your prophecies, then that disqualifies you. So if he was living in Old Testament days, he'd be stoned. <laughs> and that's another topic for another time. But uh, like I said, if you're interested, uh, in two weeks from now we'll be looking at the New Apostolic Reformation, which is sort of a spinoff from the Word of Faith movement. Um, but you're welcome to join us. But I also want you to understand that the role, the ministry of the Holy Spirit is absolutely vital to the Christian life. We can't live the Christian life without the Holy Spirit. We can't do anything that God wants us to do. He's, Jesus says, without me, you can do nothing. Well, we have him with us in the person of the Holy Spirit. And I can do nothing really to please God. He, all the things that he does for us, there's so much more that he does for us than many of us realize. He draws us to Jesus. He convicts us of sin. He baptizes. He places us or immerses us into the body of Christ, which is his church. He indwells us from the very moment of salvation. He teaches us. He empowers us. He enables us to resist temptation. He says, walk in the spirit and you'll not fulfill the lust of the flesh. He fills us, and He gives us spiritual gifts to do anything and everything that God wants us to do. And there's more to it than just that. Those are some of the main things. But His primary purpose is to glorify Jesus Christ. That's, that's His objective above all else. 
So how would you know if you're in a church? Because a lot of churches claim to be spirit-filled, and they got a lot of activity going on and a lot of recognition things going on in the name of the Spirit. And One of the ways that you know that a church is spirit-filled is not that the Spirit of God is getting all the attention, but rather a spirit-filled church is going to make Jesus Christ the focus of attention. He's going to be He's going to be the one getting all the glory and all the, all the attention. <clears throat> and Paul identifies two specific ministries of the Holy Spirit that give us the assurance of being in Christ. He mentions the grounds for our eternal, inher- eternal inheritance. Then he talks about the guarantee of our e- eternal inheritance and then the goal. So let's look at our outline. You have it there. I left it so you can do some fill in the blank if you're so prone to do that. I miss Miss Joyce because she was always taking notes. She's got, she loved to fill in the blank. Anyway, the grounds for our inheritance. The first part of verse 13, in him you also trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also having believed. And of course, we know that we're saved because we are in him. We said last week that there are only two kinds of people in the world. There are people who are in Christ and everybody else who isn't in Christ. But how does a person come to be in him? And Paul's going to explain that a little bit more when he gets into chapter 2 and he goes into detail about our salvation. But God has made it so simple that even a child can understand. He says, you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and you believed. What did you believe? Well, you believed in Christ and in Christ alone, in nothing else. It's not based on feeling. It is simply by believing the word of truth. Romans chapter 10, verse 17, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. When we witness to people, one of the things that we need to do is to make sure we use the word of God because the power is in God's word. It's not in our eloquence or persuasiveness or gimmicks or slick programs or human reasoning. No amount of those things can help somebody to understand their need of salvation. When we witness to people, we need to use the Word of God. Peter says this. He says, having been born again, not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible through the Word of God, which lives and abides forever. And so, when we're trying to witness, we need to understand that people don't need our opinions. We don't need to get sidetracked and talked about all the stuff that's going on in the world, but what we need to do is laser focus in on what the, what the problem is. And that is people are lost and in sin, and they're without hope until they come to understand that they need Christ. And so they need to hear what God says about their sinful condition and their need of a Savior in order to believe it. But believing unto salvation, that also depends upon the condition of the heart. Remember Jesus told a parable in Matthew chapter 13 where the word was likened to the seed. And he said that there's four different kinds of soil. The heart is the soil. The word of God is the seed. And Jesus said, when anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, then the wicked one comes and snatches away what was sown in his heart. This is he who receives seed by the wayside. But he who received the seed on stony places, this is he who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Yet he has no root in himself, but endures only for a while. But when tribulation or persecution arises because of the word, immediately he stumbles. Now he who receives seed among the thorns is he who hears the word, and the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word, and he becomes unfruitful. But he who received the seed on the good ground is he who hears the word and understands it, who indeed bears fruit and produces some a hundredfold, some sixty, and some thirty. Now, obviously, the seed fell on fertile ground when it went forth in in Ephesus. And and one of the great New Testament churches was planted there. 
also in your heart as you believed. But we're living in a world now where people don't want to hear it. There seems to be an abundance of stony or thorny soil, or the seed just falls by the wayside. So people don't, don't want to hear the truth. They won't receive the truth, but rather they would rather believe the lies of Satan. That they believe things like man is inherently good and that things are getting better. We're evolving. They're falling for the lies of Satan. And I mean, you want to talk about misinformation. This is the ultimate in misinformation. But, you know, we don't know the condition of the soil. We don't know people's hearts. And so that requires that we continue to sow the seed and we trust God that it's going to fall on fertile ground. As we've said before, he, he does not hold us responsible for how people receive the word, but he does hold us responsible for sowing the seed. And he's the one who gives life and gives growth. The gospel means good news. We know that. It refers to the message that God has provided the way of salvation through the death, burial, and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. Good news to offset the bad news. The bad news is that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Every man, woman, and child is condemned without Christ. Now, children, we believe that they are not saved until they make a decision, but I believe that they are safe until they have enough ability to make that decision for themselves. And John MacArthur said, Faith is man's response to God's elective purpose. God's choice of men is election. Men's choice of God is faith. In election, God gives his promises, and by faith, men receive them. So then the question remains, well, how can we be sure? How do I know for sure that I possess all of these wonderful blessings that we've been reading about? And he says it's because of these spiritual, these particular spiritual blessings of the Holy Spirit that we can be sure. And so we find the guarantee of our inheritance in the latter part of verse 13 and the beginning of verse 14, when he says, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is the guarantee of our inheritance. Most of us want guarantees in life, don't we? Some of us have learned the hard way that people can't be trusted. A handshake or someone's word is simply not enough sometimes. People can be dishonest and trustworthy, so, so we all have been geared now in this life. To, we want proof. We need a contract. We need some kind of a guarantee to make sure that we're going to get, we're going to receive what we've been promised. And you would think that here we are talking about a God who we know cannot lie, that he would be worthy of our trust. But, you know, God knows our hearts. He knows the frailty of our ability to believe. He knows we're prone to doubt and skepticism. You know, sometimes you feel like the man who says, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. God knows that, and that's why he gives us the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is there to help our unbelief. Romans chapter 8, verses 16 and 17 and I like this version of the New Living Translation. It says, For his spirit joins with our spirit to affirm that we are God's children. And since we are his children, we are his heirs. In fact, together with Christ, we are heirs of God's glory. So, so he makes these promises to us. He gives us the spirit of God as a witness to confirm that everything he said to us is true. And everything he's promised us is something that we can count on. And there are two things that he does, two functions of the indwelling spirit that secures us and assures us that our salvation is real and that we can live expectantly that when the time comes, we're going to receive the fulfillment of our inheritance. The first thing he says is that the Holy Spirit is given as a seal. When you first trusted Christ for salvation, you were given the Holy Spirit at the very moment you believed. 
Romans chapter 8, verse 9 says, If anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to him. So, when you trusted Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit came to live within you. And he serves as the securing proof of our salvation. And Paul's first word picture here is as a seal. Now, seals were frequently used in ancient times as official marks of identification. Oftentimes, a letter or a document would be issued, maybe a declaration or a decree from a king. It would be rolled up in a scroll. Hot wax would be dripped on it, and the, and the king would wear a signet ring. And the, the symbol on the ring would be impressed into the wax as a sign of, of his authority. There are examples of seals in the scripture, and with each one, you see a little bit different benefit from the seal. For example, in in 1 Kings chapter 21, you remember the story about Ahab and Jezebel. And Ahab had one of his subjects in his kingdom that had a vineyard, and his name was, was Naboth. The king wanted this vineyard but Naboth wouldn't give it to him. And so Ahab is sulking, and his queen comes in, and we all know what kind of woman Jezebel was, hence the name Jezebel. But she says, what's wrong with you? You're the king. And what she did was she drafted some letters commending Naboth to bring attention to this man, and in these letters she sealed the letters as showing the authenticity of these letters. They actually came from the king. But it was actually a setup because when everybody was gathered together and they were supposed to be giving tribute to Naboth, she paid two accusers to come forth and accuse Naboth of blasphemy. And according to Jewish law, he was stoned. And so Ahab receive the vineyard. But the seal is God's Holy Spirit established authenticity, and he's our identity. He gives us our identity that we are legal heirs. He authenticates that our salvation is real. The second blessing is authority. Remember the story of Esther? And there was a wicked man named Haman that hated the Jews. And so he conceived of a plot where a day would be chosen where it would be lawful for all the citizens of Persia to kill Jews. Problem was, he didn't know that his king was married to a Jewish woman named Esther. And a decree was issued with the king's seal, but according to Persian law, This seal had so much authority that not even the king could rescind his own order. Once it's declared, once it's decreed, the authority has been established and it can't be changed. But then Esther exposed Haman's plot to kill all of the Israelites. And the king had Haman and his family executed. And he issued another decree, allowing the Jews to defend themselves, to to stop the bloodshed and the slaughter. And so the king's seal established his authority, and in the same way, God has given us the Holy Spirit as a sign of his authority to represent him in the world. Then the third thing about this seal is that it marks ownership. In Jeremiah chapter 32, God told Jeremiah to purchase land because he had the redemption rights to it. And in the presence of witnesses, the deed was signed and sealed, and it made Jeremiah the legal owner of the property. And so the seal signifies that Jeremiah was the the owner. The Holy Spirit, who's been given to us, is is, is the sign of ownership. If anybody has not the Spirit of God, he is not his. And so the fact that we have the Spirit 
marks us out as being, we are a purchased possession, remember? Our lives are not our own. We were bought with a price. We saw that in the ministry of redemption that Jesus performed for us. In Revelation chapter 7, there's 144,000 Jewish witnesses that are going about preaching the gospel of the kingdom. And they are marked with the seal of God, and they are divinely protected by God. So the seal, the Holy Spirit, is a mark of ownership. And then last of all, it's a mark of security. In Daniel chapter 6, remember Daniel got caught praying when he was, when, when the kingdom of Babylon, everybody was commanded to pray only to Nebuchadnezzar. But Daniel had the custom of praying to the God of Israel three times a day. He was caught. He was thrown into the lion's den as punishment. King Darius couldn't do anything about it because he had already issued the decree. But they threw him into the lion's den and then they put a seal over the den. If anybody broke that seal, they would have to face the consequences. So it secured the seal. You remember the Lord Jesus, when he was buried into the tomb, they rolled the stone, and it says that they put a seal on it there. So that everybody knew that Jesus in the tomb, his body should be secure. Nobody would want to break that seal under penalty of death. So the Holy Spirit makes our salvation secure. If God is for us, who can be against us? The seal of God can never be broken. And so the seal of God's Holy Spirit represents authenticity, authority, ownership, and security from the Lord. There's a story told about Alexander the Great. He sent an emissary bearing his seal to Egypt, and he traveled without a military escort or weapons. His only protection was Alexander's seal. His message to Pharaoh was to cease hostilities against Alexander. And Pharaoh told the emissary, he says, I'll think about it. And so the emissary drew a circle around the Pharaoh and told him not to leave the circle until he had an answer. In his own country before this single unarmed emissary, Pharaoh agreed because the seal to touch the emissary was to touch Alexander. And so Pharaoh yielded to it. And the seal protected this man and in the same way, you and I are protected by Almighty God, by the seal of the Holy Spirit. Because you are sealed with the Holy Spirit, you're actually invincible. Until it's time for God to call you home, He tells us that death is an appointment, is an appointed unto man wants to die. God has already determined when our time is up. And so we're actually invincible until that time happens. We don't know when that is. But no harm can come to you when God is protecting you. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 30 says that it is by the Holy Spirit that we were sealed until the day of redemption. Now, we've already learned that we are redeemed. We have been redeemed, but there is coming a day when our redemption is going to be finalized, when it's going to be consummated. Jesus said, look up for your redemption draws nigh. We've already got our redemption secured for us, but it's not completed yet until we get our resurrection bodies. We are redeemed, but not until, it's, until that final day of resurrection. But until then, we are marked by God's Holy Spirit. And that brings us to the next word picture, and that is that the Holy Spirit is also given as a guarantee. The word there is also translated earnest or pledge or guarantee, depending on your version, of our inheritance. The Greek word refers to a deposit or a down payment. You know, when you purchased your home, you put a down payment on your home as a good sign of faith that you're going to follow through and you're purchasing that home. It's to show that you are serious. It's also kind of like a, a ring. When I gave Susan an engagement ring over 49 years ago, it was given as a pledge of my love for her. 
It was the symbol of my intentions to make her my wife, that I was promising to her that I would commit my life to her as her husband. In much the same way, when I was saved, God sent his Holy Spirit to indwell us and to seal us. As, as he said to me, Mike, I give you my spirit as a sign of my intentions to keep my promises to you. The riches of my grace, they're all yours. The, inher the eternal inheritance, that's all yours. And the Holy Spirit, he's just the first installment. He's the down payment that everything that I've promised in your word, in my word, is going to come to you. Again, we saw last week that our inheritance, according to Peter, is incorruptible, undefiled, and will not fade away, and is reserved in heaven for you. 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 4. So the Holy Spirit indwells us to show us that God will do what he said he would do. And so he uses these two metaphors of the seal and the guarantee or the pledge so that if you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, then you can be absolutely certain and secure in the promises of eternal life and that the inheritance that he has promised to us is a sure thing. And so that brings us to the third point, and that is that the goal of our inheritance. Until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of his glory. God's given his solemn pledge. He cannot lie. We are the purchased possession. We are redeemed with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. And our redemption is a present reality, but it also has a future final fulfillment in that coming day. And we see two goals that are going to be realized. Number one, we're going to be glorified. The redemptive purpose of God was to rescue those whom he purchased. God is going to finally redeem us into glory as his own purchased possession. John, 1 John chapter 3, verse 2. It says, Beloved, now we are the children of God, and it does not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he appears... We shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. What was once marred by sin and ruined by sin will one day be made perfect in his son. Now, we are in the process of being perfected. We are maturing in Christ, but we're not perfect yet. But one day we will be. One day we won't be plagued by these sin natures that we still possess. And it will be removed from us. And we'll be like Jesus and we can be absolutely obedient and faithful to the Lord. Our redemption is a completed transaction, but it will not be fully completed until we each have our resurrected glorified bodies. And that's the goal for the Lord, that we're glorified. You know, we sang earlier, blessed assurance, Jesus is mine Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. I mean, what we have now in the Holy Spirit is just a foretaste of what's in store for us. And you know, I remember when I was a brand new Christian, I was still messing up pretty good. My wife will tell you that I still do. <laughs> Tim will probably tell you that too. <laughs> but we all do, don't we? But in those early days, my mess-ups were really major mess-ups. And, I, and, and I, would, I would give in, and, and I would give in to the temptation, and I would fail. And then there were on occasions where I, I felt so bad that I would actually skip church. I felt unworthy and felt too ashamed to go. And I, then I finally realized that when I was in that state, that's when I needed to go. Because that's when I get exposed to the Word, when I get surrounded by God's people who are there to encourage me. They're all just like me. They're no better than I am, and I'm no better than they are. But we're there to encourage one another, to inspire one another, to provoke one another to love and good works, according to Hebrews chapter 10 and verses 24 and 25. But because of my major mess-ups, I found one verse for memory that I clung to. For dear life, Philippians 1, 6, and being confident of this very thing, that he that began a good work in me will perfect it or complete it 
on the day of Christ Jesus. There's another promise that what God started, and no matter how much I mess up, God started something in my life in 1979, and he's not finished. And it's not going to be completed until I go to be with him or he comes to bring me to, up to him at the rapture. So if you want a verse of assurance, something to encourage you, something to help you deal with the guilt for when you do fail, this is a good, good memory verse. It was such an encouragement to me, especially in those first, say, five years of my Christian walk. But the presence of the Holy Spirit is God's promise of our divine inheritance. And that's only the beginning. He is our assurance that there is infinitely more that awaits us in glory. There is so much more to come. So that's the goal for us, that we be glorified. But now there's also another goal that he has, and that's more important, and that is God be glorified. That's why we're here. He created us for His glory. God is all about His glory. And you know, people in the world, they, you know, they, they think that because God is all about His glory that He's some kind of egomaniac. Well, listen, when you're God, the God, the creator of the universe, there is no higher being. And so it's, it's not egocentric for Him to receive glory for everything that He's done. And we were created to give him glory. Sin made it impossible for us to glorify God. But he redeemed us and restored us, so now we are given the Holy Spirit, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, we can glorify him, and one day we will ultimately glorify him when we become like Jesus. Fundamentally, that single reality is the key to understanding what the Word of God says. If I understand that my ultimate purpose, my ultimate function is to glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, that's going to be kind of the underlying theme of everything else that I do. The revelation of all of His divine purposes is just simply so that he can be glorified. And so that's why we have the Holy Spirit. Now, if you've never trusted Christ, then you can't possibly glorify the Lord. It's impossible. You can't do it without the Holy Spirit. And you can't have the Holy Spirit until you call upon him for salvation. You can't understand what life is all about. So, if you're watching and you want to, know, want to know more, then certainly I invite you to private message me or email me at lbcdoulos, D-O-U-L-O-S, at gmail.com. And I'd love to share with you how you can receive the Lord Jesus Christ and receive the Spirit of God. And in receiving the Spirit of God, receive the full assurances of all of His promises. Amen. Let's pray together. Father, it's so much more here than we can actually comprehend to know that we have been chosen before the foundation of the world, that Christ has forgiven and redeemed us. As we heard the word of truth and we personally believed in the death, burial, and resurrection of our Lord we were justified on the basis of his resurrection. And you predestined us to be adopted as your sons and daughters. And you made us heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. Lord, how gracious and generous you are to us. To be assured that we have this inheritance, this incorruptible and undefiled and will not fade away, it's reserved in heaven for us. Lord, what a magnificent promise that is for each of us. And I pray that that, that would stir our hearts to a new level of commitment and devotion to you and service. 
And Lord, you have given us the Lord Jesus as an inheritance. But even in that, you have given us to him. We are part of his inheritance. Lord, help us to set our affections on things above and not on the things of earth. Help us to see Christ clearly, keeping our eyes fixed on him so that we can be transformed day by day into his image from one level of glory to the next. And that's our prayer, Lord. And that it would all be for your honor and glory. And we pray these things together in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you, friends. We're dismissed. And those of you watching, goodbye. We're going to set up for fellowship, so stay unique.